Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Friday, the 1st of December. How the hell did it get to be December already? But good to have you on board, as always, everybody. Today's show is brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute. Our members are the foundation of everything we do, from proceedings to naval history, conferences and events, book publishing, USNI News, all help, all brought to you uh, in significant part by the, the uh, support of the members of the Naval Institute. To become a member today, go to usni.org forward slash join. Before I introduce my guests, I have two quick announcements to make. This week marked the CEO, the CEO and publisher turnover at the Naval Institute. Pete Daly, who's been at the helm since 2011, retired yesterday. And Ray Spicer, retired Rear Admiral and Surface Warfare Officer, is our new CEO and publisher as of today, December 1st. Ray's bio is on our website. So if you go, if you Google Ray Spicer Naval Institute, you can read all about him. I'm looking forward to working with him. He seems like a great guy. Uh, the second announcement is that our annual Defense Forum Washington will be at the Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. next week. Thursday, 7 December, we have a great mix of congressional, military, and DOD speakers lined up. To learn more and to register, go to usni.org forward slash events. Again, Defense Forum Washington, 7 December, usni.org forward slash events. You won't want to miss it. And my guests here today and uh, a number of articles and authors that we will talk about today uh, will be at Defense Forum Washington. So you'll be able to uh, see them, hear them, whether you're uh, in person uh, at the event at the Spy Museum or you uh, you know, zoom in virtually, uh, you'll be able to hear a conversation similar to the one we're going to have today. All right. So uh, my guests joining me from their homes in Northern Virginia are Paul Giara and Jerry Roncolato. They ha have been my co-conspirators in the ongoing American Sea Power Project and co-authors with me of the War of 2026 scenario, which appears in the December proceedings. Paul and Jerry, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Bill. It's been minutes since we've been talking. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Appreciate the invite. Yeah, I think we've had uh, 10 or 15 emails back and forth uh, this morning uh, on the project, on the December uh, article, <clears throat> and uh, or articles, I should say. And uh, lots of people reacting to them in emails and on our website. Uh, uh, this is uh, you know, going to get a lot of attention. So, uh, Paul, I'll start with you. Just could you give us the 30,000 foot perspective on phase three of the project, which we're now in, um, and, and sort of how these articles kind of fit together? Sure, Bill. Um, thanks for the opportunity. It's good to be on with you again. Um, the first thing is that phase three is the third phase of three phases, and phase one and two went before and are inextricably uh, connected with phase three. The whole premise of the project was that the bottom had fallen out of appreciation for American sea power, both in the civilian and political communities, but also within the Navy. And so phase one was the ends of naval power, American sea power. Um, what is it in this? what we're trying to achieve, what are its basic principles. The second phase, the ends, the ways was, okay, how would you use it? And now we're into phase three, the means of American sea power. We explicitly, not only does that sequence work intrinsically, but uh, we explicitly wanted to leave means for last because that's what everybody wants to talk about, and that's all they ever talk about. And they want to talk, people seem to be predisposed to talk about systems and programs, the things they're responsible for, the things that uh, got them promoted, or the things that are going to get them promoted. We wanted to leave that to last, and, and hence phase three is about the means. Now, we set up phase three to, to, to uh, proceed from a scenario they got things running in the Western Pacific. And a couple of, just one word about um, sort of the context of this. Since we envisioned this process and this sequence uh, and this phase three in particular, the world has changed. And so we understand that it's not just about the Western Pacific. It just, the fact that this is becoming global uh, in Ukraine and now in Israel, it just makes all the problems that we're trying to come to grips with here worse. 
So that, that's a, that's what. Yeah, no, that's that's a good point. And to your your point about the 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 means, which were is the third phase, being you know the the platforms and the weapons and the tactics and the you know the eaches of. Uh, you know, how many F-18s and how many aircraft carriers and how many submarines and, and what types and how many torpedoes and all of that stuff, as you pointed out, that tends to be the, the you know, the more tangible things and the easier things to talk about. Um, and so we started this over two years ago with the strategic ends of CPAR. What does it mean to be a naval power? You know, uh, Nick Lambert's piece in April 2021, what is a Navy for? That's a foundational piece that I think I know I wished uh, when I read it, <clears throat> when we got it, when I read it, um, that Ensign Hamlet could have read it, you know, 30 years ago. Uh, it's just terrific. And so we've, as you pointed, we, we've gone from that high strategic level uh, through the the ways. How would you, um, you know, uh, how would you apply sea power in, in various ways and now into the means part? So, um uh, Jerry, let's talk about the scenario a little bit. Uh, so we, I'm, I'm also co-authors, as I mentioned, with, with both of you on this scenario. Uh, we wrote it last spring, summer time frame. Yeah. It was, uh, we, we sent it through our editorial board in uh, maybe August, September. We sent it past a, a couple of experts including Jim Fennell, who's been on this show and written for proceedings and a couple of other China experts, plus uh, some colleagues over at CIS, CSIS who wargamed a similar scenario a year ago, and that, that got quite a bit of attention. So um, if you just give us, um, you know, what is the scenario and, and maybe what isn't it? Okay. <clears throat> well, uh, what it is not is a prediction of, of what reality will be like at some future date uh we took uh and we all we all agreed on this we took we took the approach that what we needed to address the means in the context of something other than what it's been for the last 30 years other than business as usual and we decided on a a very hard case wartime scenario and uh is it going to happen it certainly will not happen exactly the way it's written, but is it possible? Yes. Is it is a potential? Yes. And as a consequence, it's something that uh, will, in many ways, could be a worst case scenario, and it's something that the military profession, in particular, needs to think about and think hard about, uh, rather than deciding that it wants to fight a war the way it wants to fight. The scenario. Pro proposes a war that is not what we want to fight, i.e. it's long against uh, an opponent who's got the home field advantage, uh, outnumbers us, possibly outguns us, certainly outmanufactures us, um, and has been focused completely on defeating us for 30 years, whereas we've been distracted. So that's kind of what the scenario is intended to do. And we asked the authors to right to that scenario and uh it's very challenging for them because it's a it's a near-term scenario you can't suddenly build you know 17 more carriers or 100 more destroyers you, you kind of got to go at it with what you got and in uh in the, in as a result of of these authors writing in each of the domains that that is naval warfare you get you get a sense of uh of where we have some shortcomings that need some serious uh, thought and this is all done obviously at the unclass level. Yeah, those are great points. And you know, to uh, to to quote former Secretary uh, Rumsfeld, you know, you go to war with the military that you have, not the military that you want. And so this China Taiwan scenario is 2026, which is well within. Uh, we are already within. You know, the Davidson window, Admiral Phil Davidson who uh, testified to Congress in March 2021 that, uh, you know, China was uh, preparing its military. Xi Jinping had told his military to be prepared to solve the, the uh, Taiwan problem no later than 2027. And, uh, you know, Admiral Davidson, the Indo-PACOM commander two years ago, said 
hey, look, this is we're in this decade of maximum danger. We are in this window, and and that has become now known as the Davidson window. We mentioned that um, in in the scenario and in this uh, series of uh, of articles. Uh, Paul, can you describe the the road to war that's in this scenario? Sure. Uh, the background is important here, especially based on what Jerry said, uh, that this is not a prediction. However, it does raise the issue, as you point out, Bill, is this, is there a Davidson window or isn't there? Are we or are we not in a new Cold War? And what do those things imply? This is not business as usual. So that's the first thing. So what we've been doing how much we've been doing clearly is not going to be enough. And the authors, I think, have responded uh, uh, to a fairly well on those, on those grounds. But this is also different in that this is not a Taiwan scenario. This is a China versus the United States scenario. This is a great power peer conflict. It starts in Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan is an excuse for thinking small about what uh, we see coming. And so that's not what it is. So the road to war is that things are rotten between China and the United States always have, have been for a long time and are getting worse. Uh, and then there is an airplane collision. And suddenly that kicks off and China attacks. It's not a bolt out of the blue because the table had been set for this. Uh, it is it is manifest, but it, the response of the collision at sea and the loss of life and the loss of those crews uh, is a manifestation of the tensions. And China, China has said, OK, enough is enough. But more to the point, the U.S. isn't ready. It's it's not going to be ready. And then we are going to have to we're going to have to carry out our broader uh, strategic and operational plans, which are to knock the U.S. back and off uh, the pinnacle. And that's where the scenario leaves us when we turn it over to the authors, where we're not way back. Uh, there are whole physical and technical connectivity holes in our command and control. The Seventh Fleet commander has been killed. Uh, and uh, the battle group in the Western Pacific has essentially been eliminated. And the authors are now scratching their heads saying, well, we don't have enough. We don't have enough people. We don't have enough munitions. We don't have enough platforms. And, and there you go. But there are also new missions emerging from the scenario that the authors have to contend with. We made a clear point of saying that there were uh, Chinese submarines detected heading toward the U.S. West Coast. What does that mean? that things like port defense and slock defense and things that we have not been thinking about at all, except in an historical sense, uh, are suddenly looming large and can ruin your whole day, obviously. I mean, uh, if, uh, just a couple of mines in the port of San Francisco uh, will have tremendous resonance reverberations throughout the entire American political system. So that's what we've tried to establish is that this is big, this is different, and this is between us and China. All right. Thanks, Paul. Um, so there are five articles after the scenario article. Um, and for those uh, at home who have the December issue of Proceedings, the print issue, uh, if you open to pages 16 and 17, that's where the scenario starts. And then the articles follow from that. And uh, in, it, I'm, I'm not naming them in the right order, but uh, Lieutenant Colonel Brian Kirg, uh, a Marine Corps planner out with uh, 3MEF in Okinawa. Um, he writes uh, the, the piece about, you know, how the Marine Corps slash uh, the stand-in force would respond or could respond. And it's titled, Put 3MEF in a Fighting Stance, uh, followed by the piece by uh, Scott Tate and Anthony Lavopa. Scott Tate's a retired captain, surface warfare officer. Uh, Anthony is a uh, surface warfare commander. Um, their piece is titled, It All Comes Down to Sea Control. Uh, that one is followed by uh, Bill Toady, Captain Bill Toady, a retired submarine officer. You can't win without more submarines. And then we've got a piece by, um, sorry, I'm flipping through the, the magazine here. 
Uh, mine warfare could be key by retired Admiral Jim, uh, James Winnefeld, Sandy Winnefeld, about mine warfare. And then I think the last one is uh, on strike warfare uh, by uh, Graham Scarborough, who was our author of the year in 2019, F-18 Super Hornet uh, Wizzo. Uh, and it is titled Strike Warfare's Inventory Problem. And you can find these if you don't have the, uh, the December issue of the magazine yet, uh, or if you read it online, if you Google Naval Institute American Sea Power Project, the homepage for the project will come up and all of these articles are right there uh, staring at you when you uh, when you pull up that page. So um, let's quickly uh, sort of overview some of these uh, articles. So uh, Jerry, why don't you start with the piece on surface warfare by, by Scott Tate and Tony Lavopa. Yeah, okay, <clears throat> thanks, Bill. Uh, the, I think the piece is a, an incredibly important piece uh, because uh, uh, several factors, uh, mostly because it takes the, the surface domain and presents it in a way that is different than just business as usual. Uh, they try to come to grips with how we're going to fight a great power war with the peacetime Navy, and uh, the delta there is pretty significant. I think their 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 main points are are this that one the surface domain is the domain. I know that's that sounds weird coming from a surface warfare officer. I got that. But what they, they don't mean it's all about SWOs. What they mean is it's the movement of goods and supplies and firepower on the surface of the sea that is going to determine the outcome. So you're talking about uh, uh, you know, large missile capacity for our combatants, but also you're talking about trade and, and commerce, both ours and the Chinese supporting ours and interdicting the Chinese. And as Admiral, Admiral uh, Leahy said in 1938, before World War II, when asked why he needed a bigger Navy, he said to control movement. That's the game. And it's about sea control. And that's where they're trying to get at. And so they asked the questions and, and posed some some uh, solutions that say, let's what do we need to be able to establish sea control? And then let's start building systems in, in the quantities and the capacities and capabilities needed to do that. And they offer some innovative ideas about how to use uh, surface combatants in particular, because they're both they're both surface warfare officers uh, that that I think are worth considering and, and thinking hard about because it, it, it gets us back to this idea that we're going to have to fight in a very challenging environment uh, on the surface, below the surface, and everything to control the surface domain uh, in this future future conflict. Yeah, it's a great title. It's all about sea control. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Paul, over to you on, uh, let's start with, uh, Graham Scarborough and the, uh, strike warfare's inventory problem. Uh, thanks. Uh, and I just want to point out as we, as we're going, at least certainly what I'm thinking about is that these articles as are marvelous. They're marvelous. The authors are terrific. They've done a great job, but they are not the end all and be all. They're not the end at all. They're the beginning of a conversation. That's what we're trying to prompt here. A conversation. That's a great point. That, that is a very, very key point. And, and one of the things I often say to people who argue about a specific article that they might read in proceedings, they may go, wow, it's only part of the story. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's part of the story, right? It's there is There are no proceedings articles that are sort of the be all and end all. Um, this is, it's a conversation and we'll, we're gonna have more articles you know, to follow um, and I should have mentioned uh, early on that we've, uh, that, you know, coming, it, it's already in the December issue is the announcement of an essay contest that goes with this series. Yeah. So it's called the Future Naval Warfare Essay Contest. And we, we, we <clears throat> ask authors, we ask potential authors and readers to read these articles, read the scenario and react to them, right? So if you agree with what uh, Graham Scarborough <clears throat> writes, um, say yes for all these reasons, and here are some other ways that we can solve this. Or I disagree, and here's why. But you're, that's a key point, Paul. Is this is the start of a conversation? This isn't the end of the conversation. Right, and uh, the the article on strike warfare is, 
the title says it all. We need more pilots, more planes, and more munitions. Um, and all of that is true. I'm a firm believer. I was a naval aviator. I wasn't carrier based, but I uh, had uh, two carrier shipboard to ships company tours. So um, I firmly believe in all this. Uh, what the article doesn't do is as important as what it does do. It calls for more of everything it needs, but it does not, however, address, and ho hopefully this will come out in subsequent conversations and commentary, uh, the, the, uh, the two obvious problems with carrier aviation, defense of the carrier, number one, and the range of the air wing and, and ability to penetrate. So these are the, these are the things that are going to uh, challenge us, certainly in this kind of scenario. And that's exactly why we have this kind of scenario, because, again, business as usual is not going to cut it. So it's a great article, uh, and the Commander Scarborough does a terrific job. But, again, it's only the beginning of the conversation. Uh, Jerry, back to you. Uh, let's talk about Admiral Winnefeld's uh, mind warfare could be key. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, uh, that article or this article, the mind warfare article, is is solid on many levels. Uh, he he his focus is offensive mining mining and its its uh, its potential in a maritime conflict. Uh, but he also talks much more broadly about what this conflict would be like and the need to employ all the elements of national power, with with the with the objective of challenging the Chinese Communist Party's hold on power. It's the only place I've seen that so far as a, you know, kind of a desired end state of this conflict once we get into it. I th so I think that's a very, and the fact that he's a retired uh, four-star, and extraordinarily thoughtful man uh, puts a coda on that that is important. Um, his, his, he talks about offensive mining and, and the fact that <clears throat> in the time frame of this scenario, we, we, we don't have much that we can offer in that regard. Uh, there's, there's great shortfalls in both the... Uh, types of mines and the numbers of mines, as far as he is able to articulate. Uh, what he doesn't talk about and explicitly doesn't talk about is defensive mining or mine countermeasures. And uh, <clears throat> the I think that's going to also be a, a, re, a remarkably important part. And it's touched on in the surface domain article that Scott Tate and Anthony Lavopa write on, uh, but nobody is really giving it the, its due course. And, and uh, do do attention, and I'll I'll leave you this with this data point. In May of 1945, when the Germans surrendered, the British had active in their ports uh, about 800 minesweepers. That's what it took for them to keep their harbors clear at the end of the war, when the Jap or sorry, when the Germans had lost what 900 submarines, uh, and and so that gives you an indication of the scale of the problem. Now, you don't need really fancy ships to do all this. You can do it with aircraft. You can do it with uh, fishing trawlers, pleasure craft that have been taken over. Uh, but the fact is that you have to organize, train, and equip to be able to do that. And I'm not, you know, I'm not sure where we're at with that. It, our My countermeasures capability seems to be evaporating as fast as the Aegis cruisers are. Yeah, great points. Uh, and to your point about uh, Admiral Winnefeld's focus on, uh, you know, the, the, the Chinese Communist Party's ability to stay in power, you know, he gets after, I'll just, I'll read a, a short quote where, you know, he, he talks about using um, offensive mine capability to block Chinese ports, not just their military ports, but also their commercial ports. Uh, and he also, uh, he, he has a, a legal explanation. He goes into the rules of war. And he, yeah. and he he explains that this is um, this is within the rules of war, the law of war. Um, we're not talking. He's not envisioning the use of mines in a way that would be uh, you know outside of the, the law of war. But he says uh, blocking these ports to prevent their use for military purposes also would have the incidental yet important effect of shutting down a major element of China's commercial lifeline. Yep. Uh, and so yeah, keep keeping the commercial. Uh, you know, the, 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 the civilian economy going will be vital to both sides uh, or all three sides, perhaps you might say, China, Taiwan and the U.S. Um, but that's one of the key things he, he points out. Um, 
Okay, great. Uh, mindful of time here, back to uh, uh, Paul. Let's talk about uh, Bill Toady's piece on submarines. You can't win without more submarines. Uh, again, this at least the title infers that we simply don't have enough of what we need. And, and, and Captain Toady, who I really want to meet because he 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 exudes confidence and 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 the right kind of belligerence. I like that, uh, especially in an area that appears to be our comparative advantage. But he, he talks about not only the the force levels, but the availability of submarines now, and he does a very nice job of laying out. Not only do we not have enough, but many of those that we do have are not available because they're laid up in maintenance or waiting for major maintenance. And he describes in his reaction to the scenario how you bring those back online, how long it would take. And that's a very, very useful contribution to this. He also talks about the, the loadouts of weapons and puts a timeline on that, which is very helpful. Again, uh, and the timeline is is all about having to go back and get more and what that means. And he lays out the losses of several boats uh, en route to those rendezvous with uh, tenders and uh, resupply. Um, the, he also talks about submarine missions in a new way that I've not seen before. He says, well, we've been constant, we, the submarine force, have been concentrating on ASW, and that's not what this is about. This is about anti-surface unit warfare, and that we have to get back to that, first, because that's what we have to practice and plan for, but second, we have to consider our magazines and inventories and how many weapons that's going to take, and then he talks about weapons inventory and manufacturer and timelines there again. Uh, he, by virtue of necessity, he has to look to other communities, and we've asked him to do this, and so he's doing exactly what we asked for, uh, to, to pick up some of what might have been considered submarine missions elsewhere. So a uh, real emphasis on uh, P-8s as an example, just one example, uh, in the ASW uh, campaigns. Um, he, the, the, the good captain did not, however, mention allies. And I want to make a point here. Um, American submarines are, by virtue of their missions and requirements, long-range heavy submarines. They, they have to be transoceanic and so on. In the at least in the first island chain. Now, this is not just about the first island chain. I understand that, but in, in the first island chain, this is a short-range, weapons-intense uh, uh, campaign, and this is where our allies can come in. So the Japanese Soryu and Taige are going to play and should be expected to play a key role here. Uh, we should be thinking of flooding the zone, it, given the deficit in our own. Uh, force levels with allied, ca very capable allied submarines uh, to uh, bring down the uh, the PLA, put the PLA Navy on the bottom. And that's the campaign that Captain Toady lays out is putting the PLA assault force on the bottom. But there's another aspect to this, which has come up uh, in Jerry's rendition of the surface uh, main article. And that is commerce warfare. Uh, right now, China is not autarctic. It depends on externalities, both for trade, but also for resources. And um, in the past, at least, this is where submarines have played a gigantic role. This will, whether, I'm not saying that this is the answer because there's so many factors here, but thinking of this as an additional mission that has not been thought of, but which is now raised in the context of not a Taiwan scenario, it's a US-China scenario. If that's the case, that highlights how can we leverage Chinese uh, insecurities and, uh, and vulnerabilities. One of the ways is to attack their commerce, and that's what Admiral Leahy was talking about 
in his 1938 congressional testimony, you control movement. You ensure your own and you and you uh, put at risk those of your enemy. So those are some of the things that inspired me in Captain Toady's article. Yeah, that, those are all great points. And and to your to your point about uh, he, the, he didn't have he really didn't have room, and I don't think he had the the uh, expertise to bring in the you know the allied contributions to this. But um, you know how to what extent would the Japanese submarine force um, participate in this? And you know they have very capable, very quiet. Uh, diesel electric boats. Uh, the Australians do as well. It'll be a while before Australia gets its first nuclear-powered submarine through the AUKUS program, uh, but they are they have Collins-class uh, submarines. You know that can certainly play a role in that, especially in that role that 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 commerce rating role that you just mentioned. Um, I, I would point out on page 40 of the article by Captain Toady. Um, he he lays out the order of battle very well. There's a there's a great analysis of how many fast attack submarines the U.S. Navy will have in 2026. He ran this by OPNAV. So when we were in the editing process, um, he said, "I'm going to run this by OPNAV," and I said, "Please not to not to ask their permission." He said, "No, no, no. I just want to make sure that that my numbers that as I count, you know, how many boats and where they are and all that stuff, that it's accurate." And they they. You know, they confirmed that his numbers were accurate. So I commend that to the readers. You know, just how many or how in really how few um, Los Angeles and Virginia class of the different types of Virginia class. And then he lays it out. You know, you got to divide these between two fleets, Pacific and Atlantic, and a significant percentage of them, about 40% right now are in long-term maintenance and so that really uh it limits the the you know the number of submarines that can play in this uh in this scenario um last one we're running close to our our time limit here but uh jerry back to you uh talk about uh lieutenant colonel brian kurd's piece on putting 3f in a fighting stance okay uh first with respect to bill toady's comment on on torpedo reloads uh, if you, and I don't, I haven't read his article in the last couple of days, so I may, I'm, I don't remember, but if you, if you think about the fact that Guam is tenuous, Japan, our ports in Japan and Okinawa are untenable, uh, the Philippines is not there, where, I mean, where our submarines are going to have to go to reload may be the same as it was in early 1942, Australia and Pearl Harbor. And that is a long haul. Um, so it, that's bears thinking about. Uh, okay, Brian Kirk did a, a remarkably good job. Uh, he's a, he's a phenomenal writer, um, and uh, he, he focused on several things. One, first of all, his article on, is is in the amphibious or or the ground domain in the, in a maritime campaign, and he his focus is on three MEF out in Okinawa and trying to make it more. Uh, ready for this kind of war. One of the things he suggests is that uh, unlike, unlike deployments from 2MEF or 1MEF, 3MEF doesn't deploy, they move there. So they bring their families, they bring all that. And, and we need to think about how, how, that's, how, those, how we're going to get those families out of a conflict zone. Um, he, he recommends doing it sooner rather than later. Whether that, whether, how, how we do it, the fact that somebody's actually raising that issue is absolutely critical. Um, he talks about the lack of shore, shore to shore connectors, um, which is translates into a lack of logistic support, and uh, the fact that the the building plans for to make up that that shortage are wholly inadequate and very very slow uh, to the point where. Even even the offshore support vehicles were only going to do three, and starting in 2026. So there, basically, there's not there's no shore to shore connection that's going to be able to support the, the scheme of maneuver that the Marines have come up with in the Pacific. Um, and and the more you read about this stuff, the more I think about the Japanese Army that l was left high and dry on the islands during the Pacific campaign. Uh, they were they were dispersed. They were maneuver elements, except they could no longer maneuver. And that's a, a great challenge that the Marines in PAC fleet, PACOM are going to have. Uh, he, he suggested including the, conceptually including South Korea in the first island chain. I think that's a great point. They're, they're not going to be able to sit this out. And uh, yeah, the North Koreans may do something uh, to, to cause uh, 
to distract the, the South Koreans. But this is very much a problem that they have to, to participate in. And the last thing he says is, <clears throat> is that he, he says within 3MF, we should be deploying forces routinely into areas outside of Okinawa in peacetime so that if the, if the balloon goes up, they're, they're already out there and, and able to operate. And I think that's, that's an important point. And, and you, again, you see signs of, of the kinds of stuff we were doing in 1941 as we knew, you know, the war was looming on the horizon. We had the neutrality patrol in the Atlantic and we moved our fleet to Hawaii, uh, which was challenging because we didn't have the logistics base there for it. Uh, but, you know, it was necessary to do. So I think he did a great job and, and uh, you know, a lot more needs to be talked about at, at the role of ground forces in this campaign. Uh, and it'd be great if we could get an army uh, article in there somewhere. Yeah, uh, one of the things, that, the images that's in the article on page 24 uh, that, that Brian brings up is, you know, family housing. As you as you point out, his article says, you know, 3MEF is kind of a peacetime movement, right? You right. PCS with your family and your dog and your, right? And there's... Uh, you know, all the accoutrements of, of base housing and all those things. And one of the images is uh, family housing at Kadena Air Base in Okinawa. So that's not just Marines, but also Air, Air Force, Force uh, housing, where many Marine Corps dependents live is uncomfortably close to the runway and command facilities, which will be prime targets in the opening phases of this conflict scenario. So, uh, you know, it's a really good point. And it's, it's pretty stark that and, and Brian deployed to both Iraq and Afghanistan during uh, OEF and OIF. And, and there, those were combat deployments. Yeah. And you, you left your family back in, you know, Camp Lejeune or, or uh, uh, you know, Camp Pendleton, yeah. or Camp yeah. Pendleton right? Um, but <clears throat> we've, we've made 3MEF a forward deployment, which is fine for peacetime. But in, in this scenario, if it were to kick off, suddenly you'd be, uh, instead of being able to fight, you would be worried about your family and you'd be worrying about, you know, how do we airlift, you know, women, you know, families and dependents and, you know, you know, all the noncombatants and all of that out of out of the, the, the battle space. So and, and, you know, when I was commissioned back in 78 and I was up at SWAS, uh, I, I met uh, a, a Marine colonel who was going for a one year on a company tour to Okinawa. His family's are staying in Newport and that's how we did it for that very reason. So it's, you know, going back to that. Okay, Bill, can I make two quick points about the Marines? Absolutely. One is that the scenario explicitly uh, lays out that we've lost sea control in the Western Pacific. Uh, and that puts all the Marine deployment plans on hold. Uh, so that's the first thing. The second is quite explicit in the scenario is that we anticipate a major land maneuver warfare on the islands and the littorals and the archipelagos of the Western Pacific. And that is something that the Marines apparently are not thinking about. Uh, I don't know that they're not thinking about it. I wouldn't be that harsh. Uh, I, I think that they are thinking about it. And the, the scenario, um, you know, we at early draft, you're right, Paul, had had major Chinese land forces already out among islands and atolls and even in the Philippines. And we scaled that back. So the scenario is, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the threat envelope is there. But the, uh, the, you know, the Chinese joint island landing campaign in this scenario is, uh, is very much focused on, on Taiwan, the Taiwan offshore islands and the, and the Taiwan main uh, island here. Uh, but, but to your point about sea control, you know, if you're trying to, Jerry made the point that, that Brian Kirk says is that, you know, these offshore support vessels, these maneuver vessels, the, the landing force or landing ship medium, those haven't been built yet. In fact, they they haven't even settled on a design yet. Um, they're they're borrowing or renting, leasing some commercial ones to to test out those concept of operations. But the Marines do not yet have a fleet of landing ship mediums, you know, for ship or shore to shore movement uh, in the Western Pacific. And getting you know the the L class ships out there in in a 
place where there is no sea control or sea control is being yeah. contested uh, certainly makes this very, very hard. Uh, and that, that comes across in spades in the scenario. So, well, uh, guys, we are out of time. We're at 40 minutes right now. I'd like to keep it uh, right around that. So um, I, I just encourage uh, our listeners and readers, you know, Google Naval Institute, American Sea Power Project, the home site will come up for this project. You can read all the articles going back to uh, February 2021. And uh, so, but, but the ones that are at the top of the page are the scenario and the five articles that we have here in the December issue of the, of the proceedings. And uh, they're, they are intended to be thought provoking. And we hope that you will uh, read them, think about them, and then, you know, come into the fray through that uh, uh, essay contest that will be, that will have a deadline of, of mid March. Uh, so my guests today have been retired Navy commander, Paul Giara, retired Navy captain, Jerry Roncolato. If you're a fan of the meat, uh, the American sea power project, you can thank them and our former CEO, Pete Daly for planting the seeds and nurturing this project for the past three years. Paul and Jerry, thanks again. And always great to have you on the show. Great, great to be here, Bill. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. All right. Well, today's show is brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute. Our members, as I said earlier, are the foundation for everything we do to become a member and, and receive Proceedings Magazine and a number of other benefits. Go to usni.org forward slash join. Hope to see you at Defense Forum Washington on the 7th of December. And until next week, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.